they have the skills necessary to go into the jobs of the tomorrow. We don't want to just equip them with what they're going to need today, but equip them with how we're going to move this economy forward. And lastly, tomorrow's workforce. There we kind of think of like K through 12, right? So you already know that we have STEM schools in the state of Ohio. There are places that you can go to get science, technology, engineering, and math kind of um, curriculums. And we want to make sure that this kind of stuff gets coordinated into those curriculums so that our students who are going to go through um, our K through 12 system have some of these skills available. And the reason is because we look, we don't just want to make sure that you have a job. We want the jobs to be here, right? We want to make sure that Ohio is open for business so that people who are creating the technology of tomorrow have a dependable workforce that they can rely on so they bring the jobs here. You know, I want the next Tesla to be built in Ohio. I want whatever the next major freight carrier who has an autonomous truck, I want them to build it here. I don't want them to build it in Michigan. I don't want them to build it in California or Texas or Florida. I want it here. And one of the ways that we do that is we make sure that our curriculum focuses on connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, UAS, and drones. Because as long as we can start incorporating some of those things, we can tell companies as they look at Ohio as a place to locate their businesses, we can tell them, look, we're creating a workforce that's dependable and reliable, right? We have fantastic research institutions. We have all this fantastic infrastructure that already exists for the state of Ohio that we can tap into. And by doing that, we can attract the businesses of tomorrow so that a few years from now, we can say, isn't it great that the first autonomous vehicle that was you know, in ready deployment was built in Ohio? You know, that's what I want to be able to say. So with that, let's talk about what we're doing. So that's a little bit about who we are and why we are, and this is what we are. So this is what we're doing. So these are the statewide projects that we're talking about. I'll go over each of them in turn, except for the Cincy Dayton Workforce Corridor. Basically, that's one of the things that we were, I was just talking about a minute ago. What we're really hoping to do is to get um, a long haul transportation carrier to have a first mile, last mile solution at the beginning, right? So we're working with Ubers, Lyfts, Chariots, so that we can get people in Cincinnati and Dayton to a bus stop, have the bus drive a long haul distance and have very minimal stops, and then get those people to major transportation hubs in Monroe, where we have a huge business park that has like 10 businesses, including Amazon and Bath and Body Works and stuff like that. So that's, um, I don't have a lot on that though because it's still in the very early stages, so you never know. That's a project that we're not ready to <laughs> really prime time yet. But here's what I'll start with. Columbus, Ohio won the Smart City Challenge. 78 applied, we won. We got $40 million to do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, one of them is to create an integrated data exchange. That integrated data exchange is a warehouse from a whole bunch of public and private data that's put together to create new apps that can do anything from doing multimodal trip planning to helping people get to and from doctor's appointments to telling truckers where there are rest stops so they can pull off and stop at a rest stop, not just sit on an exit ramp, you know? But the big thing that I want to talk about just for a second is this. That's a shuttle. On October 1st, if it goes well, on October 1st, the first autonomous shuttle will be driving around in Columbus, mapping a route. The selection committee of which I was a part, we have tentatively figured out who it's going to be. Um, we're still in a final negotiation phase, but this is where it's going to go. It's going to be on the Scioto Mile. It's going to go from Vets Memorial to uh, the Smart Columbus Experience Center to Bicentennial Park to COSI. Now, you may be asking yourself the question of like, well, why is it doing that? And the reason it's doing that is because it's a low risk route. Um, we want the shuttle to succeed, so I don't want to put it on High Street in rush hour and have it be something that people depend on. And if the technology doesn't work great, then I get a whole bunch of angry phone calls of I was late to work. Why did you do this? You know, I don't, that's, that's not what we're looking for. However, it is a route that, you know, it is very possible that if you're at COSI, you'll be like, hey, I'd love to go to the Experience Center and see what they're doing, you know? Or you might be at Vets Memorial and want to go to Bicentennial Park for a picnic. So we do think that there'll still be some usage. And the reason why we're doing this is because, to be honest, no one in the state of Ohio, Drive Ohio included, has ever actually procured an autonomous shuttle before. I have never bought an autonomous car. Charles, you have. You have a level two autonomy car, but I don't have one. So we wanted to make sure that we understood the process by which we had to go through and some of the questions we had to ask. In the coming weeks and months, you'll hear a whole bunch about the infrastructure improvements that'll happen on this to allow that autonomous vehicle to drive around. You'll hear about um, the first few test cases. I'm hoping that in the very near future, once it goes up and running on December 1st, that any of you who want to can come down and actually put your families on the vehicle. Again, if you feel safe, going back to my other slide, you know, but just to get a feel for what this technology can do. Because by doing that kind of a project, we can show people, like, look, it works. You know, it can stay in autonomous mode. And for those of you who might be a little scared, I want to be clear, in the state of Ohio, because I'm the person who helped write the executive order, in the state of Ohio, the executive order of the governor states that you have to have an operator inside of every autonomous vehicle. 
They can be located outside of it, I should say. They just have to be able to intervene, right? This shuttle, for the entirety of the year-long service it provides, will always have a person in the shuttle to answer your questions, to take over if they need to. So if you're worried, like, what if it, like, what if a duck jumps out and it jumps into the river? Like, no, don't worry about that. There'll be a human being on board that will be, make sure it's duck-proof, so there won't be any problems, you know, going forward. Next thing I want to talk about is Connected Marysville. Connected Marysville is a very, Great project, it's a special project because we think, we're still researching this to make sure we're true, it's true, but we think this is the only city that will have every signal in the entirety of the municipal boundaries have a roadside unit attached to it. So every one of those signals will be connected to each other. We're super excited because what that means is we're gonna start testing things like preemption, right? So going back to safety, you know, I'm sure you've seen it. When, a, when an ambulance or a police car needs to drive through a stoplight, it has to slow way down because even though it's allowed to go through the red, it doesn't want to just blast through the intersection because someone might not be paying attention. Well, the technology that we're talking about here will be able to say, hey, I've identified that an ambulance is coming. Every light's going to be green for where it's going. It'll hold the reds for everybody else so that ambulance doesn't have to slow down so it can get to where it wants to go faster. We're talking about the deployment of solutions where they can see a pedestrian coming around a difficult corner and it can say like, oh my gosh, the person who's here isn't gonna see that and it can either send a warning to your onboard unit in your car or it'll just hold the red light. Similarly, if it sees a car that's just speeding and trying to rock it to make that yellow, the light will go, yeah, you're not making that yellow. You're gonna run it. And it will hold the red light for the other direction. It won't necessarily keep that light green, but it'll hold the red light for the other direction so we don't have a T-bone. So from a safety perspective, this is a fantastic opportunity for the state of Ohio to see how this technology operates in reducing those kinds of bad crashes that we see at intersections. Plus, um, beyond that, we're even utilizing um, some uh, federal highway funds to see if we can get a saturation level of up to 20% connected vehicles to see how that impacts safety. Because one of the things that you hear about is that connected vehicles are great and autonomous vehicles are great, but when there's only a couple of them on the roadway, they don't really make an impact, and that's true. So what we're doing is we're trying to deploy over 10,000 onboard units to make sure to see what happens when we have a massive saturation in a small area. You know, do we see what we think we're going to see, which is a major reduction in accidents? a major reduction in crashes, reductions in pedestrians being hit, reductions in T-bone accidents and intersections, reductions in anything from people being too drowsy when they're driving home and hitting someone. So this is a very exciting project. The next is the US 33 Smart Mobility Corridor. It runs from the Transportation Research Center, which is the world's most preeminent testing ground and proving ground for autonomous connected technology. We're building a brand new facility there that can do everything uh, from inner city driving to rural driving conditions as a simulation. And it goes all the way back into Columbus, go through Marysville and Dublin. What's great about this too is we can go from an urban environment to an ex-urban suburban environment to a rural environment using roadside units along the whole way. So there's a ton of fiber optic cable in there. I am not a tech person, so I'm sorry if you're gonna ask me technical questions about the fiber optic cable, I'm just gonna, you know, like stare off into space because I have no idea. But what I can say, because you are all way smarter than I am, so what I can say is that those, that fiber optic cable will be connected to roadside units so that we can send signals to the vehicles that are driving along that corridor to tell them anything from there's a pothole 30 feet in front of you to this is how you merge when you're entering onto US 33 to there's an emergency vehicle to the one that we're really trying to see if we can get working is wrong way detection. Right? So a warning that someone's gotten on and they're coming the wrong way, get off the road. Because I can tell you, when, on our traffic management centers, they can tell you that when someone gets on the road going the wrong way, it's just a slow motion crash. Because that's what happens. They just hit someone. So if we can warn drivers, get off the road, someone's coming because they're on the wrong side, we're hoping to see a reduction, a major reduction in those kinds of accidents and maybe we can actually stop people before an accident happens. So what those roadside units do, I'm sure you guys have seen something like this. So on 33, because we're trying to do multiple different kinds of technology solutions, on 33 we're going to be using roadside units and DSRCs. So what that means is um, the FCC has allowed um, automobile manufacturers and departments of transportation, the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum, to be able to have dedicated communications between vehicles and fiber optic networks. So that's what those are. So the roadside units are the short range antennas that will otherwise be able to send the signal to the car and then the DSRCs are the actual antennas on, on, on the cars that will be able to receive the signal and send information back. 
Right now, there's a basic safety message that we can get. So we can get everything from like, okay, well, this is how fast you're going. This is the kind of car you're driving. You know, your seatbelts are engaged, a couple other things. Um, but we are running into some difficult times because we want to get additional information, anything from tire pressure variations um, uh, to rotations of those tires, to so the way the axles are reacting to the pavement. Um, and each of the vehicles have a different messaging service. So we have to work with all the OEMs individually to see if they will decode that for us. But once they do that, if they do that, if we can get them all on board, then we'll be able to use that corridor for a ton of information. Both the information we want to send out, anything from, you know, here are the weather conditions. Hey, there's a, you know, there's a crew 30 feet ahead of you that are actually working on the pavement, so you should slow down and pull over. There's a whole bunch of utility that we can use for this once it gets up and running. The next one is the I-670 smart lane, so going to the reliability corridor. You can see, um, basically, the General Assembly gave the Department of Transportation the capability of saying that we can close lanes and vary speed limits in the near future. So who has been on 670 when it's a mess? It is a mess. <laughs> we can't pave our way out of that problem anymore. We can't keep adding lanes. We can't make 670, 72 lanes going either way, right? That's just insane. Like, there's, we don't have enough room or enough money or enough, you know, eminent domain authority to, to, to build that. So instead, what we've been finding out is that if we create an opportunity for people to open up that lane and we lower the speed limits on all those lanes, we actually get more throughput. So you would think, okay, well, lowering it down to 45 miles per hour, we would have people go slower, but that's not the case, right? When the speed limit's 65 and you're stuck in a traffic jam, I'm sure you would prefer to go 45 miles per hour. And by opening up that lane and allowing more throughput on it, we actually get most of the traffic back up to a normal speed. Most of them go back up to 45. Now, some people have told us, like, oh, well, that's not going to work because unless you photo enforce it, no one's ever going to comply. But what we have found on the I-90 corridor, which I'll get to in a second, that because we use human beings to make the decisions as to when to open that lane and lower the speed limits, we have much higher compliance because there's that last check, right? So a computer may go, oh yeah, we should totally open it up. And if the computer does that, then people just get used to it being it's always the same time of day, it's always the same kind of conditions. But when a human being is doing that last final check and they make sure that it's only being used conservatively, that it's not just open all the time, then we find that the compliance rate is much, much higher. So that last human touch, at least on this technology, is extremely helpful to increase our compliance. So the next one is the I-90 Lake Effect Corridor. So I can say that ever since this has gone up, so this is another variable speed limit corridor. So this is both safety and reliability. This corridor has a whole bunch of road signs that can actually go from being 65 to being down to as low as they need to go. As a horrible inclement weather corridor, we're talking about a place where if any of you have driven it, it can go from clear as day to complete wide out over the course of six minutes. So to combat that, we've said like, okay, well, when we see weather conditions coming, we're going to go ahead and lower the speed limit. Because if we lower the speed limit, your likelihood of skidding out, crashing, hitting the person in front of you, not seeing where you're going, greatly decreases. Now I can say that the last year's worth of data that we have, we had no major multiple car accidents since the deployment of the technology. So it's working. Now we can talk again next year, because if there's a 70 car pileup, then I'll have to come back and be like, well, it worked for a year. You know, we have to get more data. It's more longitudinal than just two years in a row. But right now, preliminary estimates are that it's working. And they have changed the speed limit over 100 times. Over the course of the last winter, they changed it multiple times. And they got a lot of great data, because like I was just saying, if the roadside unit says, oh my gosh, I'm frozen, you should lower the speed limit, and a human being looks at the conditions and sees that people are traveling at speed, it doesn't look like people are swerving, or people are getting involved in like little tailspins, then they don't lower the speed limit. Because just because the sensor says that something's going on doesn't mean that the people will comply if you lower the speed limits. They are reserving it for times when both they can see that a weather condition is bad or it's obvious that one is coming. And again, our compliance rate for those variable speed limits is extremely high. It's in the 90%. And that's without photo enforcement. That's without going ahead and putting a camera on the speed limit sign and then sending a trooper out to go get you, you know, 50 feet down the road. So the next stage of that project is to then outfit those signs with roadside units so that we can feed information both back from the traffic specifically and then feed information to those cars. So that we can know when people are running into problems so we can corroborate the data that we're getting on those sensors. 
But that's to come because, as you can probably guess, there's not a lot of electricity up there, and there's not a lot of cell phone service up there, and there's definitely no fiber up there. So we're talking with companies like SiriusXM who think they can actually provide us with a solution where they can provide, they can actually send the signal to our vehicles, and perhaps receive the signals back from the vehicles. So there's some exciting technology going on. That's what I'm. And that's just kind of a. These are the different solutions we're going to have to figure out on, on the I-90 corridor. So last thing I'm going to talk about real fast, and I don't want to steal Fred's thunder. I don't know if Fred went before me or if he's going tomorrow. He's after me, so I won't speak on this too much. But uh, the UAS Center is part of what we do at Drive Ohio as well. We are integrating unmanned uh, aircraft into all the things that we do. Um, we're very excited about a couple of projects that Fred is working on, but uh, we can do, we're working on everything from being able to fly beyond line of sight to being able to do unmanned traffic management. Uh, this is a drone that's kind of giving feedback on a disaster zone. But some of the projects we're talking about is instead of when someone calls 911 and just goes, oh my gosh, I saw an accident, it's horrible, and they go, well, then I guess we're sending a fire truck and a police car and an ambulance because we don't know what's wrong, doing a rapid deployment of a drone that can survey the area quickly and then pinpoint where to send someone, pinpoint where to send the, you know, emergency response vehicles and pinpoint what to do so that we're notifying the right people. And that's just a little representation of what it looks like. So last thing I want to say, hopefully I haven't been too boring. If I have, I apologize. But the last thing I want to say is the biggest challenge that we run into right now is what you see on the screen. So that ad is for a GPS unit from General Motors that utilizes all of the sensors in the roadways to tell you how to get from point A to point B. And you might be asking yourself, what sensor in the roadway are you talking about? And the answer is none of them because they don't exist, right? Like your GPS system, it's not based on a little magnet that's in the ground that spits out a signal to your car and says California is that way, right? Like you use your phone and it triangulates a signal somehow in a magic way that might as well be magic to me that, that tells you where you're supposed to go. So what we are concerned about and why our projects aren't super big in scope is because we don't want to run into the Betamax VHS problem where we deploy a whole bunch of technology and find out that we guessed wrong. Right? Or the Blu-ray HD DVD, if you want to go that way. We can make update a little bit. So we're deploying solutions on small scales to see how well they work as proof of concepts to then allow other municipalities, other locations, to make decisions for themselves, right? Like, yes, we're doing Marysville. Yes, we're doing 33. Yes, we're doing the shuttle in Columbus. We're doing all these great things. We're creating scalable blueprints so that anyone else who wants to look at these solutions for their own use cases can either scale them up or down to meet their needs. We're not going to force anything on anyone. We're not going to say you have to have DSRC or you have to have cellular VDX or anything like that. We're just trying to make sure that we facilitate how that technology works so we can give our experience over to other people. And lastly, I do want to say that if all goes well, in the future, we may not even be using cars. We may be using vertical takeoff and landing vehicles that use little airports that are off of our highways. So it was a vision a long time ago, and it didn't work so much because we couldn't get the airspace worked out. But some of the things that Fred's going to talk to you about, Fred Judson from our UAS Center, it may not be as far off as you think. So what I said at the beginning was that we have a, we have a problem today of over 303,000 crashes. Technology is going to be what solves that problem. I don't know if we're going to have flying cars, right? But we are at least have autonomous and connected cars. And so what we'll do is we just need to make sure that as this technology comes up, we don't get afraid of it. We just make sure it works. And that's what Drive Ohio does. So there you go. My name is Peter Voderberg, and I'm Managing Director of Drive Ohio Regulations and Policy. And if we have time, I can answer any questions that anybody might have, because that's kind of the end of my presentation. Sorry to talk about manure right after you got back from lunch. Hopefully it didn't upset any stomachs. but. I am, uh, like I said, I'm more than willing to answer any questions anybody might have.